Hoch squail each tenoy up twice tonight quen quen shaman sis quen sna tenat pla slahan tenat ten chla slahan okamea omish chen iman tenat pla stalo hawaiian e swiss on wanoxton squalowin on hach and squalowin titsuits so I was just sharing um, in my language, I'm Skolmish, speaking Skolmish Snechem, and that it's a good day, everybody. Toits Tanat is my ancestral name. Sis is my nickname. Uh, I come from the village of Aslahan. I am Skolmish. I'm also Stalo and Hawaiian and Swiss, and I respect who I am. Today is a beautiful day, and uh, we're gonna go on to Drumbeat Productions now. Hey everybody, what's up? It's me, Miss Christy Lee, and I come from this place called Malay, where we are sitting today at the mouth of the river. This is the home of my ancestors, the home of my children, and the home of our future generations. I just wanted to say welcome and thank you for this beautiful day. It's such a pleasure to sit in the sunshine and share this beautiful land and all the history and knowledge with my children today. We just came back from the forest up the way picking salmon berries. Temlime, Temlime is salmon berry season. It's so beautiful to enjoy the, the nutrients that nature provides. I'm so thankful that we can pass down these teachings to the next generation. And I just wanted to give a great big haichka, haitsepka, haitsepka to all the matriarchs, all the filmmakers, the cinematographers, the editors, the sound people, um, everybody who's holding it down at the I Am Four Labs. Much love to all the work that you do. Much success and blessings for this virtual celebration that you're holding. Haitsepka, haitsepka nasiem nasiaya. Respect. Unmute your mic. There we go. 
Okay. Uh, I wasn't sure. <laughs> I kept thinking there was one more thing coming up. So <laughs> <laughs> sorry about that, everybody. So here we are here with Susan Kite and Dallas Flett, and we are going to have a conversation about Indigenous media and uh, futurisms. And so, yeah, um, love it if you could each introduce yourselves and maybe we'll just uh, take it from there. All right. I think we should start with Kite. Uh sure, sure. Um, uh, paid to watch Dave and talk EFP, uh, Kite and match EFP. Um, my name is Suzanne Kite. Um, I make art under my last name, Kite. I am currently here uh, in Tongva land in Los Angeles, California. I am kind of in between places as I'm moving through the world during this time. Um, I have been based uh, for almost three years in Montreal, uh, going to school at Concordia University. Uh, and I, there I'm a PhD uh, candidate uh, in, in the Indy program. And I am also a research assistant for the Initiative for Indigenous Futures. I uh, am an artist, I'm a composer, I think a lot about listening, um, talk a lot about AI, and I think I'll leave it there, talk more about myself later. All right, uh, see, so yeah, I guess I'll introduce myself now. Uh, I'm Dallas Wapash. I'm uh, in a new Soto from Kisi's First Nations. Um, kind of doing yeah a bunch of different things uh i work as a game designer working on a game where you like play as a piece of bannock and uh kind of like a swampy cree language learning game sort of thing uh but then uh i'm also an artist who works in interactive art forms um right now i'm pursuing like augmented reality uh and like installations related to that sort of thing uh maybe in the future i'll move on to like infrared and stuff like that but uh, yeah, basically any sort of uh, art form that involves like some sort of interaction with uh, digital media uh, is really uh, something that I'm interested in and that's what I pursue in my practice. I forgot to say that I'm Oglala Lakota. <laughs> that sounds well good. <laughs> After introducing myself with Lakota, I forgot to say that I'm Oglala. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so I, I guess we just nice uh, to hear about all. Yeah. Your... Go ahead. Oh yeah, <laughs> I, I was just gonna say I, I guess uh, I was gonna just start off with like uh, I don't know maybe like one question to sort of just get the the ball rolling that sort of thing. Uh, but I guess one of the first things that like Jason and I talked about um, was like where we first got our start. Um, and so like mine started when I was eight years old uh, with this like super tiny camera. Um, and I was just wondering, uh, like, what got you interested in working with, like, you know, digital art forms? That's a good question. I, it's been a long, very weird path where I began, um, I think it really begins when my, my aunt is, um, is Alicia Spiegels, who's a klezmer fiddler, uh, and she gave me my first violin, which was her first violin when I was, I think I was five. And at that point, I just wanted to play violin so bad for so long. And I studied that over the years and studied that through, went to community college for four years. And then I, at that point, community college, I realized, I was starting to realize things like, you know, I was like 19. I was like, I've only played dead white men's music. Um, you're really great if I didn't have to do that. Um, so I started to play jazz, um, started to, I wanted to play jazz, but I, I'm just really not good at it. Uh, but then I started to take com composition classes and I became a composer and I was still very like, I, I liked electronic music, but I felt like I was inaccessible as a classical violinist. So then I started um, kind of, I started to do hip hop violin and that went, that, that was fun. and. But then I went to um, CalArts uh, for music composition. And there I, I was like totally over the violin. I never wanted to play again, uh, but I did want to play with the, in the computer. So I started to compose through the computer. And then I started to realize that I had all these tools at my disposal. I had like wiggled myself into having access 
to the video equipment so I could check out these like projectors and cameras and tables and I could start to like rig things together. And I realized that was really fun and interesting. I wanted to like hook up the um, projector and then I wanted to control the projector through all these MIDI controllers we were using in class, in music class. So then um, I started working with my friend, uh, James Hurwitz, who built me my first body interface. And so then I was able to have like, basically on the very like bottom line level, the body interfaces are keyboards that you wear. They may not look like keyboards, but they're just MIDI signals hooked up to the body. So when I did that, that kind of opened up the doors to thinking about why the body, why my body, why interfaces, why computers, why sound, why listen, why do I care at all? And then I think it's just kind of, gone on from there and everything else is just kind of a, a version of that over and over. No, that makes sense. Uh, one of the works I was looking at um, uh, in order to get familiar with like the sort of work that you do, I was looking at uh, everything I say is true. And yeah, it's definitely like rung through like when you were talking about uh, like your experience with the violin. Uh, Cause I definitely heard a lot of that uh, in that piece and oh my goodness, those projections were insane. Like that looks like it took some like serious uh, choreography to get set up and like, I think the the end result was, like, super impressive. I was, like, watching it on YouTube, and, like, there was a part there where uh, I think the pro I, I totally don't understand, like, how the technology is working, but, um, like, I think it was, like, a projector on a mirror or something like that, because at one point there was, like, 30 of you in, like, this, this frame, uh, and, I'm like, my jaw just dropped. I was, like, oh, my goodness, what am I looking at? This is awesome. This is such a, like, uh, exciting use of technology here and I think that's really uh, kind of at the heart of like what uh, you know what we're trying to do here is just make like really uh, awesome installations that like not only look awesome but like mean a lot to us um, and so yeah it's nice to hear that um, like your practice has this sort of um, familial start. Yeah the uh, yeah the, that's a good piece to to look at because the piece that piece is very specifically about how um, I can use technology to trick people and how in many of my pieces, I'm controlling things with my body through you know, very magical technologies where the, where there's it's radio from my radioing from my body. There's no cables, all this sort of crazy stuff. But that piece is very special to me because I am not controlling. It's a duet between me and the tech wizard who's sitting at the computer. My partner, Devin Ronneberg was, my tech wizard for the first iteration of that. And mm -hmm. to do it, I'm like faking people out. You know, that's, that piece is mostly about like my grandfather teaching and how he's able to convince people to believe him. Um, and um, when, he, uh, when he's uh, doing medicine and then how we're able to, as artists, make people believe us, even if we're not quite saying the truth as well. And I'm in that tension and that relationship to technology. So yeah, my, family's always involved in some capacity <laughs> that sounds that sounds awesome yeah it sounds like you had like a, a similar path to the one that I'm kind of taking right now because um, part of my education was going to uh, a community college where uh, I was learning stuff like web design and graphic design uh, and then like that sort of uh, focus um, kind of shifted along the way because like when I first started there uh, I was like, okay, I'm going to like get this degree in web design and then that's going to be it for like the next 20 years. I'm just going to like hole up in my house and just make websites for people. Uh, but eventually somewhere across the line that, um, that sort of shift kind of uh, changed for me. I was wanting to uh, sort of like make things that uh, were in some way related to like my ancestry and my culture um, because like sort of the way I, uh, I grew up, there was like barriers, I guess, in place in terms of like me being able to learn uh, like who I was and then also being able to sort of be who I am um, in like uh, these like, you know, educational spaces and things like that. Uh, so there was definitely like some some things that I worked through that I think I've like overcome now at this point where I'm more comfortable in my skin and like saying who I am, being proud of that um, and, you know, making work that, uh, you know, speaks to uh, not only like my identity, but I don't know, maybe in some way could try and um, excite others who are maybe facing the same barriers that like I did when I was younger, that sort of thing. So definitely think it's important to be proud of who you are. 
Yeah, it's um, I, and I think it's it's complicated for a lot of people. And I think when when I I had a ve- I have a very weird path to becoming like to getting to this now because I was adopted and so was my mother. And so in order, so when I was growing up, I had a lot of encouragement to be a violinist. Um, but then once we got to the point where it was like, I, okay, I want to go to art school and like really study violin. My parents were like, whoa, are you sure you want to spend this crazy amount of money to be an artist? Like, don't you want to like be successful or <laughs> don't you want to be able to support yourself? And so, uh, you know, I had to, I had to really say to myself, which made me feel very different from my peers in college. Um, I had to say to myself, you know, if I do this, this is how I have to, this is how I'm going to have to support myself and my community. If I don't, if I don't do it well, then it was, it was worthless, you know? And um, so I really had to, it's really like a do or felt like a do or die thing to, to make art. And I don't think everybody, I don't think everybody has that, um, has that facing them when they're, uh, when they're starting out. And so, you know, as I started to make, and I started to make art and started to actually it was when I started to like really use tech in my art, I realized that I had these openings to make things that had to do with being Lakota. And like I could, I could, it wasn't something that I could afford to leave out. Like anybody can make a tech demo. Tech is really good and it really does really awesome things. But in order to like get somewhere that's different or special or interesting, um, I think being culturally grounded things take you there and I don't really want to do anything that's not that some level of cultural cultural grounding because I, I didn't have it growing up so then when I had it later on I was like I need this and I cannot I cannot let this go and you know so yeah I think that's um that's definitely part of it and how the winding path <laughs> Yeah. Um, so, yeah, when I was reading up on your work, um, I had to Google the term epistemologies because I like didn't know what that term meant. Um, but uh, it, like the way I understand it is like it's a way of knowing and like knowledge structures. Um, and so it's cool to hear that you're working with um, like Lakota epistemologies with this uh, like technology, because um, I think it's like uh it's not only like awesome and like an act of survivance and like, you know, the continuation of culture and stuff like that, but I think it also like uh, is an important lens that like these newer technologies are sort of needing. Like we need to be adding our voice uh, to these uh, newer technologies because uh, you know, maybe the capitalistic lens uh, is like in a race to the finish line to sort of like finesse them in their own way to, for the most like broadest appeal and that sort of thing. But it's uh it's kind of different for us because you know maybe we're working towards like uh you know our own community values or supporting our own like community initiatives and things like that like language preservation and uh you know cultural retention but also wanting to keep that like uh maybe isolated to the community the nation the culture that sort of thing um and so yeah i think that's like an important uh perspective that uh you're lending to like those technologies um because it's like stuff that we got to do, you know? Yeah, I mean, I'm glad you looked up epistemology. I like to use the bigology words because I think a lot of the times when um, non-Native people describe, you know, deep, complex Indigenous philosophy, they like to say, I, I often, you, you see the ways of knowing, ways of being sort of words, but then in but Western philosophy gets to have all those big ologies, big philosophical terms. And so I really, I encourage, um, I taught a class for the first time this fall and I really encourage the indigenous students to use, use the big words. Like, um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, we are, our, our stuff is, is complex and important and invaluable. And yeah, and I, so when I think about epistemology, so like ways of making knowledge, um, ways of doing knowledge and acting knowledge, I think that word is, is so um, inspiring when it comes to relating to technology and especially with VR and gaming and anything that gets the body involved. I, I read a book by Siebert Young Bear um, and uh, Lakota singer, and he was like, I can't, I, wanna, I don't wanna quote him like 
exactly because I don't think I can remember off the top of my head, but talking about how the body is always involved, especially in singing and dancing. When we make knowledge, our body is 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 there doing the work with us. And and so I think that that is a different way than some Western philosophies of thinking about how knowledge is made. And so I think that's important. That's why I make wearable technology and that's why I think it's important that listening happens not just with the mind. And my grandfather's always his favorite thing to tell. I mean, I love it when he tells me this, and it's and he's you know he's admonishing me. He's like, you, you got to get out of the head. You got to get into you know this part um, because uh, and I do. I rely heavily on the brain because it's it's easy <laughs> uh, than 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 living with the whole entity and having to function with it. But you know. Um, I think that that's what I mean. That's what all these technologies are bringing us closer to. Is it's like old coming new ways to get to like really old knowledge. Yeah, that makes sense. And lately, um, at least for me, like um, I've been trying to like maybe in uh, there's a way to phrase what I mean. Um, but I want to use my practice as a means to also like just get to know my family better. That sort of thing. Um, because like it, it may not like register when it's in like a live video chat, uh, but it's uh, I'm kind of like a super shy person, and sort of that shyness like bleeds into my interactions with uh, my own family and stuff like that. Uh, like I don't know, I feel like when they think of me, they think of like, oh, that's Dallas. He's like in his room making the games and stuff. He looks at the monitor and the game is being made <laughs> or something like that. Um, but I definitely want to use um, the medium to like sort of lessen uh the distance that maybe uh i feel with like maybe my elders or like my uh you know my distant cousins that sort of thing um i really want to use my practice to get the to know them better uh just by like being present and like finding ways to sort of lessen the geographical distance uh between us because especially during a time like this uh traveling is kind of hard to do um and my folks are like the shortest uh drive away from like one of my family members is like four hours um but then there's also like a 12 hour drive and like i feel like that distance just gets like larger and larger um so yeah definitely using like art as a tool to like be present with my family and stuff like that so there's definitely different approaches that i think people could have for their practices and stuff i think art i mean especially when you think about art in terms of way like one thing that i realized about becoming an artist and becoming someone who works in a creative way was that it was, it's a way, to, it, it is a way to have a career. And, a, and I really hope that if one thing I can, when I meet younger indigenous people than me to be like, you can make a career out of this, you can be successful, um, you can do good things and um, it's, it's totally possible. And I think about like, I, I can use my creative energy and the gifts I was given in order to um, bring success to other people in my life. You know, that's, you know, I, some, some may call it nepotism and indigenous, but like <laughs> indigenous nepotism, but it is, it is the way we, we you know, we, we bring each other up um, together. And like, I've been doing this, these performances um, during this lockdown time uh, with my cousin, Corey and uh, Corey Stover and, I have been doing these performance, they're experimental performances where uh, it's basically any excuse possible to have a public conversation with my family members. And we talk about, we talk about death, we talk about funerals, we talk about things that we don't understand. Uh, I think on, I think July 2nd, I really hope that's the right date. I think on July 2nd, we're doing a performance together through Q Foundation, and we're going to be singing, we're going to be teaching each other a lullaby in Lakota and talking about why our family has deafness, that we have a, we have like a family mythology about why deafness runs in our family, it has to do with a, a curse on a judge, um, and uh, some, some crazy, some crazy story, but Talk, talk, but just talking publicly. And the other thing I really like to do, because I get, because it's a like great excuse. I can take money from my university and I can get in, a, I can get to my family who's too far away for me to afford to visit them, which is, I think, the best use of my funding possible. I hope they agree. <laughs> but I, 
you know, I'm doing the PhD so I can continue to get closer and closer to things that I really want to know. And I can't know without being there. And I could never have afforded to be there if I had, you know, I don't know what other, if I continued to drive for Uber in LA, like I was when I, you know, that's, that was my job. And yeah. And I think that the other thing I really like to do to make sure I get closer and closer to my family and my work is I, I've been trying to have them as co-authors on uh, publications. So uh, if you talk to Jason, I know you just talked to Jason and um, we have this position paper coming out and my vignette in the position paper is co-written um, with uh, my aunt, um, Melita Janice Stover and uh, Corey Stover. Cause I called them during the research process and I was like, I know some of these things, but I would rather you, I'd rather it be from you, be your words, you know, um, as cult, as knowledge keepers and as experts, you know. And I think that's super important to do. I also just published a, an interview with my grandfather, um, Mahpia Nazi, and we talk about, he gave me a beautiful lecture uh, on why stones should be our, you know, why we are in intimate relations with stones. Um, why they are important to the Lakota and yeah I'm just so proud of that I was able to get be able to get this far when I when you know I don't know 10 years ago I didn't even know anybody in my family so yeah. Yeah. well I think that's a totally like valid approach to take to I think it's like a, an example of like how different uh our like epistemologies are uh compared to like western thinking because um like I don't know, like it kind of in the Western world, you have to jump through these hoops in order to get these titles that will somehow like validate what you're saying. Um, but it's not those hoops aren't necessarily like accessible to everyone. And so I think it's um, like a totally uh, valid thing to do is like um, involve like your family who have, uh, you know, this knowledge that like needs to be shared and has been like uh, sort of like, I don't know. I'm like thinking cyclically right now how that knowledge like just goes from generation to generation and like it isn't suddenly uh you know it isn't suddenly worthless just because um just because like i don't know we didn't get a phd or something like that or like a bfa or an mfa or something like that um so i think yeah that's a totally awesome way to um work with like the kind of systems that are have been imposed on us from like the western world and like western thinking and stuff like that i also think like technology is super awesome because it can like um it can be used in like much different ways uh, for like our communities and stuff like that. Um, like, as I said earlier, there was um, like technology could be used for like efforts in language revitalization or, uh, you know, retention of culture and stuff like that. Um, but the way that technology looks could totally be like um, altered to suit the needs of that uh, community uh, in particular. I remember like one of the, the last classes uh, I was in, it was the same class I got to write about Bannock for my final paper, which was super awesome. Um, but one of the things I wrote about was this uh, one community that was uh, getting really into like filmmaking and making documentaries uh, because the elders were wanting a way to uh, sort of keep that knowledge available for the youth in the village that they were in. Uh, and so after a while, like their words sort of became immortalized and they found ways to keep that knowledge like local um, and I think they like found ways to make it so that like those videos would just play for those youth like on a routine basis sort of thing. Kind of like how it would be if, uh, you know, I just went to my grandma's to have like tea and cookies and stuff like that. Yeah, the I feel like, I mean, I feel like games to me do that really easily because I mean, they're, when I, I was a gallery sitter for the Abtech show that was on at Concordia, I think the first year I was there, I think it was in 2017, 2018. And um, sitting there, it was amazing because you could see that, that kids, kids would come in and be able to play through the entire game and be able to communicate to the family members that they were with what was going on in the game. And that, that really clearly bridged um, a generational communication divide. Um, and, you know, I think one, one thing that you made me think of just now was during our uh, Indigenous Protocols and Artificial Intelligence Workshop, which was, uh, seems like 
a millennia ago, but I think it was last <laughs> summer, <laughs> last summer or last uh, spring, there was a there was uh, some participants who were talking about like how we'd like to use AI in the future. And uh, some participants, very different from I think what my community would say, some group, some participants wanted were wanted to make an AI elder and they wanted to make the AI elder to transmit knowledge. And I think that that kind of gives me the heebie-jeebies a bit to, to take our elders and turn them into uh, computerize them or something. I mean, there's a lot of ways I can see AI working uh, to in culturally ethical ways, but that, but that community is different. It's a different indigenous community. They have different ways of thinking and different ways of working with technology. And I always use that as the way to tell me to remind me that um, how uh, multi how many uh, I don't know multiplicitous our way our epistemologies are and and how many good things they can do with technology even if we apply them in different ways in different communities. Yeah, that makes a ton of sense. Dang, yeah, like I, I definitely I feel like technology is so like broad and it could have so many different uses. Um, and so, like, I think one of the biggest uh, barriers towards technology right now um, and might, I don't know, like, we could definitely work towards resolving this as an issue. But I think accessibility is, like, um, one of the, the bigger barriers between, like, these communities really empowering, things, empowering themselves with these uh, technologies, like, in ways that suit and, like, adhere to, like, the rules and needs of that, like, community. Um, and it's just inter interesting to see like how that might uh, take shape. I think one of the things I want to do uh, in my lifetime is uh, sort of bring the technology that I know to like indigenous youth um, to um, to like, I don't know, explore things like game design and uh, interactive technologies and things like that, just to see, uh, you know, what needs might be popping up in their communities. And suddenly they have these tools now um, that are, I don't know, able to help them uh, maybe alleviate some of the, the things uh, that they're, you know, currently going through. Of course, like the biggest one that I'm able to identify, and it's probably because I work with uh, like learning language uh, primarily in my practice right now. Um, and it's like, you know, language revitalization. Um, so I could see definitely like a bunch of different ways that, you know, game design could fit that bill or uh, like interactive technologies in terms of like engaging with these real life objects and suddenly seeing like, I don't know, like say there was a rock or something. And if you had like this augmented reality lens and you looked at it and suddenly like a word comes from it. Um, that's what we made. And actually that's what, that's, that was made in our um, IPAI working group. Um, where oh, it's yeah. going to be published any second now. I I really I think <laughs> it's like almost ready to be go public. But there's but there was a whole team working on making a Hawaiian a AR app. Um, so you could point it at the object and get the Hawaiian word. Um, but then it, but a culturally grounded app like an effort, like you know talking about how you can do that in a good way and not just an extractive way. So, but that would be, I mean, I would love that for Lakota. I've got a bunch of Lakota apps, but I would really love it if I had, uh, you know, something that I could. So someone's got to make like the platform so then all, so ind other indigenous developers can use that platform to make their own, um, you know, I, that, that would be so cool. But hey, that might be one of the bigger grants I try and apply for in like five years or something like that. That'd be <laughs> awesome. You should. That'd be totally deadly. <laughs> Cease, did you have any uh, questions for us before we move to Q and A? Yeah, I was just reading the chat and <laughs> about to add a question. Um, it was really wonderful. I I felt really uh, privileged to to listen and uh, listen to the two of you flowing and thinking back on when I got started in just regular media arts and, and how uh, a lot of the things you both said really resonated to me and, you know, how in the beginning I was like, am I doing the right thing, documenting elders and bringing their stories out? And I, I find it interesting that the, some of these same questions about protocols and respect to elders is really coming out and, I guess, um, I don't know if it's a question more than 
uh, just asking you both to elaborate more about how your culture has helped you form the, the cultures you both come from, how it's informed and helped you to form your relationship with futurisms. I mean, I didn't really engage with future, I, the idea of future very much at all. I was very reticent to deal with it until I got to Concordia and was involved, I was just automatically involved in the initiative for indigenous future. So I had to really, you know, try to understand. And then after, I feel like I've worked through that now, but I feel like, I mean, I also want to say that, you know, I really, in the time, I didn't even know, I didn't know a single indigenous artist when I was in my master's program. I, I knew about two of them and just how I really knew that I wasn't done learning because I didn't know any indigenous, no, I mean, I really wish that, you know, people had, people in my master's program had been like, there are other indigenous artists out there. They're alive too. <laughs> you can meet them. And, uh, but then now that I yeah. have gone through this PhD, I mean, I've seen, now I know that there are so mm -hmm. many people, who, so many indigenous yeah, how about Oh, are you, am I switching? Oh, uh, yeah, we should totally let Kite finish. <laughs> oh, yeah, I just want to say that the, um, yes, that the oh, I think we're, I think we're on delay a bit, the, that there's so many media artists, digital media artists who have like paved the way to let me do what I do now. And, and so now I can even have the opportunity and like the privilege to think about the future, as opposed to, you know, I was, you know, something else. So I'm, I feel really grateful to come at, at this point in time. So go ahead, Dallas. Sure. Um, yeah, I, I think uh, like futurisms are some things that I might be uh, like exploring more in the future. I've certainly like had them in like my head canon for a little while now. Um, and like sort of the way that my uh, culture is like informing how I think of and engage with that space is that there's these um, there's these sort of like cyclical structures in like the stories that are um, like uh, shared within that culture. And um, I think sort of that like relates to the idea of uh, futurisms as well, because they're, they're pretty like timeless, you know, like um, they're showing these visions of how uh, things move in like these sort of sci-fi environments, but it's not necessarily like, all just futuristic stuff like you can definitely see where like uh there's sort of a synchronicity between the past the present and the future and how those maybe like inform each other and then i also like can see that in like uh sort of the way of thinking too like from uh my culture it's that like um you don't borrow or you don't you don't inherit the earth you like borrow it from your your children or something like that um like sort of that way of thinking and so definitely like that that sort of cognizance of time is something that i think is uh really like kind of the the linking point between um you know my culture and thinking about futurisms and there's like even these like these sort of timeless characters uh like uh Wisugi jack uh or whiskey jack is what my family calls him um and he you know has these stories where he's going through these uh you know these so sometimes awkward scenarios um and it's just like it's totally like a timeless lesson that somebody could apply like the same way from 30 years ago to now to maybe even 30 years into the future um and so yeah i think that's where i sort of connect those two dots so we have a couple of things on here uh one um is uh, I'm actually gonna go to the question two and then I'm gonna go back to the other question. What would you say is your favorite indigenous made video game um, that's not Never Alone? <laughs> oh, oh Dallas, answer this one. Yeah, uh, oh my God, this is <laughs> like super hard answer. <laughs> yeah, uh, cause like <laughs> my sort of repertoire of indigenous games totally just like ballooned out of nowhere when I went to Imaginative last year. Because uh, there were so many like awesome uh, ideas and concepts being uh, brought forth in these uh, indigenous games. Like there's ones that uh, I think it's like when rivers uh, were trails that shows like sort of, you know, a different side of like written uh, history and, and things like that. Uh, but then there's also these games that uh, imagine 
sort of hypothetical scenarios happening based on like what's already happened, like uh, Terra Nova. Um, oh my goodness, this is uh, this is super tough. Like maybe I could cop out and say like my Bandit game is my favorite Indigenous game because it's mine or something like that. But no, I think. Uh, Oh my goodness! I I probably say like Terra Nova right now. It's my it's my favorite one like right now. Uh, just because like it's so cool, you know. <laughs> nice. I actually haven't played it yet. I haven't had an opportunity to play it, so I'm gonna have to go with um Hey Al Who Ho Who Who. I don't know how to pronounce the last. Don't want to mess that up because I played it like a hundred times uh when I was gallery sitting. So definitely my favorite because I got to the end. So. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> I, I think it's okay to have more than one favorite game. And I think, <laughs> you know, at this point, like you said, we're just, even those of us that are in the know about uh, the games that are being developed and that have been developed, it's it's hard to, uh, we've gone from not, it's, it's very similar to what you've been saying, where you think it's just this big, but the world is, <laughs> the indigenous futurism world is really a lot bigger than it was uh, a, a few years ago, you know, even when I was getting into uh, making that that progress and change from regular digital media to futurisms and seeing, you know, the connections and stuff. Another thing that was asked is, do you, can you both uh, share some beginner tips for getting started with AI uh, or how someone may start getting into this? And yeah, just uh, with AI. Just I mean, I'm a beginner too. Uh, there's a lot. There's a lot to learn. I think. Um, I think the thing I first found very, not very accessible, but accessible enough, and it, it was a learning curve, was to was to learn how to use some some machine learning tools. Uh, so I started by learning Weckinator, which is Rebecca Feebrink's project, and uh, they there is there are tutorials for Weckinator, and that's W E K I. And a t o r and so that's um, a, a good tool for making uh, um, art, uh, music, and video stuff with because it deals with OSC messages. So um, I found that a good place for me to start as a musician. And then um, the other thing that I am am, am really loving playing with now is uh, oh gosh, uh, there's a you could yell to my partner in the other room and he would know what I'm trying to say. There's there's a there's a software I'll think of it by the, I'll figure it out by the end, but there's a software where you can use machine learning tools um, to, to you, to do uh, uh, on, on visual stuff like photographs and video. And the other thing I'm learning, I'm learning right now how to use, which I did figure out, I'm very proud of myself, is the GPT-2 text um, generation uh, application, which is available on Google Colab. So you're able to uh, make a data set, feed it, language and then uh, be able to prompt it and so it spit it out. So I've been writing scripts, like movie scripts from this, poetry, um, crazy, crazy stuff. And I think there's a website where you can just play with a version of it called um, Talk to Transformer. It's, it's very, it's like haunted. It's, uh, you know, the internet is haunted. And then you can like, you can ask it questions, you know? Uh, so I, I highly recommend those to like start to dabble in machine learning. Um, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. well, we when I hear, oh, was that sorry? You, but uh, I'll let you answer. But there's a question for you specifically next, uh, Dallas. So, oh, yeah. yeah, sure. Um, so sure. when I hear AI, I really don't know much about AI. Like at most, I could say, is that Adobe Illustrator? Are you making like vector graphics or something like that? Uh, <laughs> and if you wanted to get started with that, maybe go to like Ins Inkscape or something like that, so you wouldn't have to pay like a monthly fee. That system is like pretty wild how Adobe's working with its like creative cloud kind of thing. So I'm like trying to find alternatives to that sort of uh, way of life. Um, but uh, I don't know, there's this sort of joke that like uh, coders have where like um, you could fake AI by writing an endless list of like if statements. So it's like, if I awake, uh, am I tired? Go back to bed. Or if I'm awake and if I want to keep going, then like stand up and things like that. Um, but yeah, otherwise I am totally not equipped to <laughs> give any sort of advice on AI. <laughs> I, I remember, I remember too the, the the free software. It's called Runway ML. So Runway Machine Learning is a free software to like play with the 
machine learning visualization stuff. Sweet. If, um, maybe if you could type that in to send to Colin and he can put that out yes. into our network. I'll type, and, I'll type all of them. Yeah, out. so a couple of one for you, one for Dallas and, and then one for you. So one for Dallas is I'd love to see some of your language work around AR and VR. Maybe you can share some links. And uh, this one is from Caroline Old Coyote. And she was saying that she um, uh, she was uh, part of the Hua Ki'i um, Hawaiian AR app that you mentioned, Kite. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You can yeah. talk a bit more about your AR VR Dallas, and then I'll go into your question next. Yeah, sure. Um, so the AR that I've been working with right now um, has been like uh, a way for me to like slowly learn my language and be uh, introduced to like some of the sort of language structures that are in place. Um, and I'm totally like a beginner at it. So I imagine uh, like the titles for uh, my works are currently um, like, uh, like the grammar might be incorrect, um, like in terms of how the order is. Uh, but right now uh, it's actually going up tomorrow. We're doing this like virtual exhibition, uh, Taylor MacArthur and I, and in uh, that exhibition is where I'm able to show some of the AR uh, work um, for uh, like working with language in terms of like uh, syllabics, um, like Swampy Cree syllabics. Um, and then like in real life, I have this uh, keyboard that um, I created my own font basically. And on this keyboard is like uh, the syllabics that I would use uh, to speak in Swampy Cree. And so yeah. it was kind of a like process to figure this sort of thing out. Um, because like I had to find a way to make this dot sort of interact with uh, the other uh, syllabics like after they've already been typed because uh, otherwise I would need like 60 different keys uh, for this keyboard. Um, but yeah, that stuff will be uh, revealed tomorrow when we when we go live for our virtual art exhibition. Um, and so, yeah, because of the whole like pandemic situation, we weren't able to exhibit in like a physical space. So we had to move to a more uh, virtual one. So uh, hopefully you're still able to get the sort of idea uh, near the end of my exhibition where I work with um, uh, AR, but that's something that I want to uh, explore in the the future there. Uh, that's the link right there. I put it in the, in the chat there. Um, but yeah, in the future, I want to work with like, uh, like physical objects and seeing if there's like uh, some way to interact with them in an AR space. Nice. So um, question for Kite, uh, can you tell us more about your music? Which I was happy about oh, that question because oh. I'm very intrigued. Uh, yeah. So, um, so I make less music than I'd like because it, you know, the thing that you're really the most into, it's like the thing that stresses you out the most and you're like, no, 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 like the, the, the sun is not the right angle and there's, it doesn't smell like whatever in the room. So I can't make music today. Um, so th that happens to me, but, um, but I do have a record label, um, which I co-run, uh, with my friend Mint Park, uh, who goes by Baca and it's called Unheard Records. And we put out compilations and albums that I just put out an album that I made back in 2015 called People You Must Look At Me. And, uh, the way I compose is I, I am like a total cheater. I, I get my favorite most amazing improvisers in my community and um i have them improvise in, over a certain structure i'm a very i don't know I'm, I'm a structuralist i love structure and i love to play with form and use form to, to do things and so so that if you listen to that album it's a chiastic structure where it is recording from uh my mother's funeral in the center and then it's enfolded and encased in different uh, sound recordings and improvisations of my of my closest friends and so and uh, I think and then what I did was they improvised and they didn't hear each other and then I arranged it to make this cocoon around the center recording and so so that's there um, and uh, I generally use you know I have my aunts on there uh, Alicia um, the, the saxophonist Mapana Roberts is on there um, uh, Harpist. Uh, Mary Lee Donovan, and yeah, I'm. That's the that's kind of how I compose when I do. Nice. 
Sweet. Um, I love that music is where you started and then it, it took you on these other journeys and helped you discover the things that uh, take you down other paths and, and continue to make this field really interesting and intriguing for you and fresh, right? I feel like a lot of uh, our own personal interests and stories can really blossom in, in the work that we do. And I feel like listening to the two of you, I'm so excited, um, you know, when I think about the indigenous futurisms and the future of indigenous artists, I look at you two and I, I'm, I'm just tingling with excitement and I, I can't wait to see the things you both create and uh, the paths that you go on and the collaborations that you engage in and, you know, and, and you're both so damn smart. It's fantastic. <laughs> smart indigenous people. And it's, uh, yeah, it's just not the world I grew up in, but it's one that I'm excited. That you created. About. It's a world that you helped create. Well, help build a path for you oh all. Oh my God, yeah. you're going to make alone, me cry. <laughs> so it's a bit emotional for me seeing just how beautiful your works are and impassioned. Yeah. So oh, last words. And <laughs> We're all just crying workshop, by the end. Saying, check out the workshop, check out our workshop. Q and drumbeat will come in soon, but um, yeah. So, yeah, the, work oh, yeah, the workshop. Is, yeah, let me, uh, I think I can plug it. Um, so, if you go on the I am for um, uh, website, you can register. something new um, but also as a way to like get to know how the west is looking at our land mm -hmm. exciting yeah well thank you both for your time today and yeah i guess um we're gonna cue into the to the drum beat for the final minute and again really you know, in my language, we say Chenquen Mentomi Wit, which means really good work. <laughs> Bill the IA. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank you. And thank the staff for making all this happen. It's fun. So I guess we leave it to our technicians. <laughs>